Hi class, uh, welcome to week two in Psych 543, Evaluation and Treatment of Compulsive Disorders. I hope that you all are doing well and that you are adjusting back into school mode. I know sometimes it's hard to get back into the swing of things, especially after a long break. So I hope that you guys are all uh, experiencing a smooth transition. Just a reminder, I am available via email, via phone, via text message for any concerns that you might be having about this class or about working in this field. I want this to be a safe place for you to voice your concerns. So today I'm going to give a lecture on chapter two. I am going to review the PowerPoint. This PowerPoint is from our Foundations of Addiction Counseling textbook, which is a wonderful book, so I hope you are all enjoying the reading. And I will just kind of go into more detail, and if you have any questions, feel free to write them on the discussion board or do whatever you need to do to get them answered. If I can't answer them, as much as I wish I knew everything, I don't always know everything, no one knows everything, but I will make sure that I get your question answered one way or another. So let's go ahead and get started. So drugs and alcohol, as we read in chapter one, have been around for a very long time. They were accepted culturally and still are in some areas and were used for various purposes. Even anxious, ancient warriors used alcohol before battle to boost their courage and decrease sensitivity to pain. For some people, the ingestion of chemicals results in substance or ingestive addiction which will be discussed uh, in a lot greater detail throughout this chapter. For others, certain behaviors or processes such as gambling will trigger a process addiction. So really addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So there's a lot of brain chemicals that are altered, um, Addiction really affects neurotransmission and interaction within reward structures of the brain, including the nucleus accumbens, interior cingulate cortex, basal forebrain, and amygdala. It really affects our brain's reward system. Uh, I know that things with the brain, sometimes the brain can be very confusing. It could get complicated. I'm gonna try to simplify things as much as I can. I don't want you to worry too much about all the terms. I know some of them are long and hard to pronounce, but it's really just the concepts that I want you guys to understand. And a big thing for not only this class, but just as clinicians, it's really whether you specialize in addiction or not, you will come across someone who has an addiction, has a compulsive behavior that they're struggling with, or has a loved one who has addiction or had a parent who was addicted to something. So it, it's relevant to whatever specialty you decide to go, move forward with. It is biologically driven. So it is not just a bad habit. It's very important to realize that it is not just a choice that someone is making all of the time. I guess it starts with a choice, but as the addiction and the use continues, it turns into a physiological response. So really addiction, kind of reviewing what addiction is, it's the inability to consistently abstain. So no matter how hard someone may be trying, they have a difficult time cutting off the use. Um, it is a disease and it involves continued use of substance despite serious substance related problems such as loss of control over use, health problems, or negative social consequences. So signs of addiction include using more of the substances than intended, difficulty reducing the use. So someone might say, I'm only going to do this much and then it turns into more than they've ever done, cravings, so they might have strong desire to use the substance, and a significant time spent obtaining, using, or recovering from substance. Uh, also, there is social and occupational problems. So 
not being able to go to work or function to their best ability at work, either because they are under the influence or recovering from uh, using maybe the day before. And it really uh, turns into a problem with interpersonal relationships. So they might lose their family, they might lose their partner. In addition to finances, it becomes really expensive, uh, not only because they are spending money on obtaining the product, but they are also are inhibited in their ability to perform their work function. So they may even get fired or they might quit their job because it's just kind of consumes their whole life. Um, there are also physical effects. So building tolerance. So we'll get into more detail about tolerance, but in brief, this is needing more of the substance to achieve their desired effects. So as they continue to use uh, their body is able to handle more, which in turn leads to an increased use and also withdraw symptoms. So physical or psychological symptoms when not using the substance. Again, we will get more into detail uh, later on in the slides. So addiction is a disease, like I said, very important in order to maintain your empathy for clients who are struggling with this. It's really important to just remember that addiction causes changes in the brain structure and functioning. It is not caused by poor willpower or character flaws. Addictions are uh, usually a result of trauma. So the person one way or another experienced trauma in their lifetime, which led to their coping skill being using substances. Addiction can grow slowly and it isn't e always easy to see. Many people with addiction continue to function in some parts of their life, but have problems in other areas. And just to kind of clarify terms, relapse uh, means returning to regular substance use after a period of sobriety. A lapse, on the other hand, is an isolated incident of use without returning to old patterns of substance use. So moving on to our first slide here. Addiction. Um, the addictive process has many components. So there, of course, are behavioral elements. Obviously, when someone is under the influence, their behaviors change greatly. Either they uh, likely do things that they aren't normally going to do when sober, or maybe they withdraw. Depending on what they're using, we know things like heroin and, um, you know, opioids, they could be kind of a a downer, so just kind of in a in a haze, or we have things like meth, where they're like an upper, as I say, and you know they kind of are more of like a, a manic, if you will, drug, where you um, are really up and you don't need sleep and you have a lot of energy. Um, and addiction may or may not cause physical dependence. There are certain drugs that we will differentiate as we go that have a physical effect where you will become, the person does come physically dependent, but not all of them. Our body, uh, bodies eventually adapt to it and need it in order to survive unless they are um, safely detoxed in a controlled environment. So let's move on to slide three. So neurobiology and physiology, physiology of addiction, excuse me, you guys, just a kind of a heads up. I always screw up these terms. <laughs> they are for some reason so hard for me to pronounce, but um, you hopefully get the picture and get the idea of what I'm saying. So there is no single biological factor. You know, uh, it's not just one gene that someone has that is going to lead them to addiction. It can certainly be genetically influenced. However, you are not doomed if you have someone, a parent or someone in your family member who is struggling with addiction. And also, um, in turn of that, you are not immune to addiction. So if, say, if there's no one who has an addiction in your family, it doesn't mean that you are not capable of developing an addiction. 
there are environmental factors that also play a role, including abuse, trauma, bullying, things like that. Our brain changes with addiction, as I stressed earlier. So the prefrontal, the something, uh, area of the brain that really changes is the prefrontal cortex, which controls complex activities. So things like self-monitoring, social thinking, our abstract thinking, our morals and our behavior. Um, these are impaired when someone is struggling with addiction. And it could also lead to permanent da brain damage, especially a big one is alcohol um, use can lead to the volume shrinkage and there are changes in connections between our neurons and these can have lifelong effects. So a key area that is kind of stimulated or triggered or changes with addiction is our reward pathways. So one pathway important to understanding the effect of drugs on the brain is called the reward pathway. So these pathways are, um, everyone has them and they are all kind of, I guess, stimulated or they are all triggered when we are um, doing something pleasurable. So for me personally, it's shopping or um, eating ice cream. I love ice cream. Uh, so for me, naturally, that's like a dopamine high. Dopamine, I want you guys to remember dopamine is associated with pleasure. So when we have something pleasurable, whether it's food, water, sex, we all experience these things. Um, our dopamine is released and it feels really good. So um, obviously we like that feeling. It, it feels good, right? But someone with an addiction, uh, it's kind of like Dopamine, as I say, it's like enhanced. So the ventral tegmental area, which is the VTA, is in the midbrain. So this is where our dopamine is primarily produced. And it's produced in the VTA and it releases to different parts of the brain area, including the nucleus accumbens, which um, plays a role in our motor functioning our prefrontal cortex, which plays a role in our attention and planning abilities. And they are, dopamine's released into all of these areas. So there's a visual on slide five that kind of shows you what I'm talking about here. See the VT8s, the midbrain, nucleus accumbens, prefrontal cortex. Dopamine is this purple part and it's released into these areas, which basically meaning it's amplifying our ability to um, feel pleasure, okay? The book also gives another visual um, of a brain that is using cocaine and it kind of breaks down what that looks like. Um, Basically, it affects when you're using it, if, um, it interferes with the normal action of dopamine by blocking the removal or reuptake of this important neurotransmitter. So it, it continues it be, the dopamine to be released, meaning that you feel good uh, for a longer amount of time and it's, that pleasure sensation is amplified. So we have a ton of neurons in our brain. We have over um, 100 billion nerve cells. Neurotransmitters um, are things such as dopamine, GABA, and glutamate. Now glutamate is our brain's excitatory neurotransmitter and its functions are things such as learning and memory. So that makes sense given that when we drink so if someone drinks a lot of alcohol or too much alcohol, they have a hard time remembering or things feel kind of blurry. There are also neuroreceptors. And on slide seven, um, here is another visual. 
and it is also how cocaine interferes with neurons. And if it's, I know it's a little, might be kind of blurry for you guys, but it also is available in the book and it will go into greater detail. Uh, piggybacking off of this, there is another slide of a PET scan. A controlled brain versus a brain on cocaine. You see the differences here. Um, the book gives you a better breakdown of what areas are being affected, but if you could see how much red there is here versus how much yellow there is here. Neurobiology of loss of control and compulsive use. So the frontal areas of the brain include the ACC and OFC, which are areas of the brain that are affected when someone has obsessive compulsive disorder, also known as OCD. Additional areas of, int of intense study that address the compulsive nature of addiction and continued use despite adverse consequences, such as the uh, inability to stop using even after um, major family job or integrity losses, involve another part of the brain, such as the Cortico-basal ganglia network. Our brains are physically damaged and they are less capable of learning. So research shows it is possible that all addictive drugs, including alcohol, can affect the, uh, the capacity for change, such as plasticity, in the cortico-basal ganglia networks, thereby altering normal learning processes that are critical for selecting and controlling actions. So as we know, our brains are neuroplastic, right? So fortunately, we have the ability to rewire our brains and change the way maybe we think or change um, habits, which is a beautiful thing, but this ability is can be limited with ongoing drug use. So we're less capable of learning new things, particularly with um, effects of alcohol on the brain. So 50% of alcoholics have some degree of brain damage. Uh, research just suggests that as compulsive using and drinking continue, the brain sustains physical damage and becomes less capable of actually unlearning that behavior. Continued emphasis on brain circuitry altercation, alteration can assist counselors in improving their understanding and empathy when the addict cannot just stop. So going back to what I said earlier, we need to remember this, right? Um, we, you know, we have the equipment to see how the brain literally changes with, with excessive alcohol use. And that's very sad for them because as much as they might want to change and as much as the person, you know, um, is ready for change, it's very, very difficult. It's not impossible, of course. It is not impossible, but it is very difficult. So it's, it's a really kind of added piece of shame for these people when, and we know the um, deleterious effects of shame on a person that these people carry with them. There is more damage to the right hemisphere. So just kind of remind you guys, or if you didn't know this already, the left side of the brain is responsible for controlling the right side of the body. It also performs tasks that have to do with logic. So that would be like science and math. On the other hand, the right hemisphere coordinates our left side of the body. And this, um, performs tasks that have to do with creativity. There is volume shrinkage with drug use, like I said. So research shows that um, a alcoholic brain is comparable to a brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And it significantly disrupts neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the growth and development of new brain cells and tissues. So it your brain is less capable of making new cells.
tolerance and withdraw. So the difference here, it's important to know the differences if you don't already. Um, that it's important to understand in the field of addiction to tolerance. So the brain and central nervous systems neuroadaption to continual surges of neurotransmitted neurotransmitters has often been misunderstood. So tolerance is one of the first signs of physical dependency. So this is a very big red flag when you hear about someone's increased ability to uh, consume more and more of the substance. As counselors, we must be well advised to address binge drinking or drug abusing patterns sooner rather than later. So as it continues, it gets worse. Um, just to clarify what uh, we classify as binge drinking, binge drinking uh, for females, it's four or more drinks. And for males, it is um, five or more drinks in any one drinking episode. And interestingly, women are more um, at risk I, for certain medical conditions. So heavy alcohol use in women increase the chances of osteoporosis, which we know is a serious bone condition. And one of a major concern to a physically active individual would be this because it um, our body stops absorbing calcium, therefore our bones get really brittle. So we should also be very aware that um, women have a greater incidence of complications from alcohol use and experience. More physical damage actually occurs with less alcohol in a shorter time frame compared to males. So for some, the, just the way our bodies work, males are able to, um, I guess, handle more alcohol for a longer period of time without the physical effects. So going on, just to clarify again what tolerance is, so someone who drinks often will naturally be able to drink, consume the same amount, or consume more, and reach the same feeling, meaning that eventually, say someone needs three drinks to feel drunk, if they're doing this on a daily basis, eventually they'll need four drinks and then five drinks and so on to feel the same effects. Metabolic tolerance, this basically refers to the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of drugs. This is how our body processes the intake and use of drugs. So when a substance is used for an extended period of time, the body creates a tolerance that makes a substance less effective which will require more of the substance to create that same physical effect. Pharmacodynamic tolerance begins with a cellular process to a substance um, and it is reduced with repeated use. So basically the brain becomes desensitized the more we use the substance. Higher tolerance leads to higher risk of dependency. This is the point where addiction becomes really scary because eventually someone's body, need, you'll, you'll hear people say, I just need to take it to feel normal. I just need to use it to feel better. Um, and that's when it, that's a sign that you are physically dependent on the drug. Withdrawal can be life-threatening. Uh, substance withdrawal refers to the physiological changes that occur when a substance leaves the body. These changes, depending on their severity, I guess, can provide evidence that pharmacodynamic tolerance is present. Most withdrawal symptoms, which are usually the opposite of drug effects, so instead of feeling really good, you feel really bad, can begin within four hours of last use and may continue for varying lengths of time and it, it could last from three to seven days, depending on the substance, uh, the degree of the physical dependence, depending on genetic factors, and also the overall health of the person using. So kind of a benign way to think about this is a hangover. So say you have a long night of drinking 
and the next day you don't feel good. You might have a headache. You might feel like you're throwing, you're going to throw up. You might throw up. You might not have a good, um, have a lack of appetite and just kind of be cranky. So this is an example, like I said, benign example of a substance withdrawal. And you might hear some people say, I just need a drink the next day to take away my hangover. So that's kind of really what's going on in the body. And it's more complicated progression. So that's a minimal example. But when it becomes more complicated and extended use uh, over time continues and takes place, Withdraw, depending on what drug it is, can manifest as mild to extreme tremors. It could include nausea or vomiting, mood disturbances uh, that create pronounced anxiety, depressed mood. Someone might be really irritable. Someone may experience anhedonia, which we know is a big symptom of depression, meaning that we can't kind of enjoy what normally a pleasurable thing is and that think back at the dopamine levels remember um, dopamine is produced when we feel pleasure um, it could also lead to neurological disturbances such as delusions headaches sleep disturbances mild to severe to severe seizures uh, delirium and visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations. Visual being seeing something that's not there. Auditory may be hearing something that's not there. Tactile meaning uh, feeling like maybe like bugs are crawling on your body. Physiological condi conditions can also occur. So this might be diarrhea, goosebumps, fever, uh, cardiac complications, including elevated blood pressure, pulse, and cardiac arrhythmias. So you know, your heart's affected. And a complicated alcohol withdrawal, for example, is one of the most serious life-threatening types of withdrawal. So you could die from alcohol withdrawal. So someone who is addicted to alcohol, it is so important if they are, um, you know, wanting to detox or come off of it, they need to be in a medically equipped area for them to do this. Um, Nearly 15% of alcohol-dependent indi alcohol individuals can have withdrawal seizures if they're not medically de detoxified. So when I worked at the crisis stabilization unit, um, this was actually in Riverside, we would get a lot of individuals who were using substances, and when they would come off, we would call them, they would be having DTs, which means like tremors, um, they were withdrawing. And we would have to call an ambulance to get them to a medical facility to make sure that, because we were not medically equipped to handle that, and you could die from alcohol withdrawal. So it is very important, like I said, to be in a controlled environment and around professionals who are competent in dealing with that. So substances of addiction, uh, depressants, there are stimulants, cannabinoids, hallucinogens, and opioids. We are going to get into greater detail here. So depressants, uh, one of depressant is alcohol, and these suppress the central nervous system. Another is sedatives or hypnotic drugs, but first I want to talk about alcohol. So alcohol is actually the most abused mood altering substance today. And uh, you could also, it is also referred to ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Um, approximately 71% of people in the United States over the age of 18 report alcohol consumption within previous 12 months in 2012. So it's, it's pretty popular. Um, it's known as humanity's oldest domesticated drug. Excessive drinking is the primary risk factor leading to injury and a major cause of death ranking third in the US. So this translates to one preventable fatality that is alcohol related every 48 minutes and nearly $51 billion in total costs for alcohol related crashes. So whether it's due to the alcohol itself or it's due to like a drinking and driving accident, the uh, risk for some type of fatal accident is pretty um, 
impair, I mean, it's pretty up there and it's really scary. So I just kind of want to talk about ethanol and proof. Sometimes, you know, we hear things like, oh, this is 20% alcohol or, um, so to better determine the potency of ethanol, the term proof is used to indicate the beverage's strength, or in other words, the percentage of pure ethanol in the, in the beverage. So using, you don't have to like memorize this formula or anything, but just to kind of gain a better understanding of it. Using the standard formula, one roughly doubles the percentage of ethanol to determine the potency. So um, like an example would be, wine is generally around 7% alcohol, this would equate to 14 proof. The same is true for over-the-counter like cough and cold preparation containing alcohol. Um, popular brands may be 20% of 20% uh, alcohol or surprisingly 40 proof, which is pretty high. Conversely, to determine the percentage of ethyl alcohol in a beverage, one can divide by half the designated proofs. So that would, so like, uh, for example, rum would be 151 proof, and this would equate to 75.5% ethanol. So mood altering effects occur pretty quickly uh, within 20 minutes, because basically what happens when we consume an alcoholic beverage Ethanol is readily absorbed into the bloodstream through the lining of our stomachs and small intestines. So the mood altering effects, that kind of buzz feeling that you get is um, pretty quick to come on. The effect of ethanol can be moderated by a variety of factors such as food in the stomach. So if someone drinks on an empty stomach, obviously they're gonna feel the effects more because they don't have any food in their stomachs. Um, someone's total body weight, so someone who has less body fat and um, is a smaller size is, gonna, is not going to be able to consume as much as someone who has more body fat. Uh, gender, so basically males can generally handle more than females. Gender issues pertaining to substances, if you're interested, are also discussed um, in more depth in Chapter 18. And also the response to alcohol, so someone who drinks more is going to be able, like more frequently, is gonna be able to handle more compared to someone who um, only drinks on occasion. So it's interesting, so take into consideration someone who's a small body weight, so say someone who is like 120 pounds versus someone who is 160 pounds. If the smaller person uh, it drinks more often and the, the um, person who has more body weight than them doesn't drink often, eventually the smaller person is going to be able to consume mo more because their tolerance is increasing. So the alcohol is metabolized by the liver as a toxin, actually. The liver is the major organ responsible for eliminating or detoxifying alcohol, and the main job of the liver is to metabolize or excrete toxins processing ethanol as a toxin to the system, hence the appropriate term intoxicated. So it's actually a, a toxin that we are placing in our bodies, uh, which, you know, a, as we learn that and we know that it makes sense why there are such damaging effects. So there are some myths of drinking pots of co coffee or taking frequent, frequent cold showers. Um, like say someone's very drunk and you hear, oh, just put them in the shower and run cold water on them. This is actually a myth. This does not speed the rate at which the liver metabolizes the ethanol. There's no substance that exists that can accelerate the rate of breaking down ethanol. So it's basically, you just have to ride it out. Um, side note, a really interesting um, book is called The Teenage Brain. And this, um, is really a great book that kind of breaks down what happens in a teenage brain. Um, the book is by Amy Ellis Nutt and Frances Jensen. I really recommend this, especially if you want to work with teenagers or kids. Um, 
the reason why it's such a good book and really, really kind of powerful is those with little experience drinking alcohol don't understand that overintoxication can be fatal. So since death due to overintoxication doesn't, inc- you know, isn't something that occurs frequently, or at least we don't hear about it a lot, awareness of this danger is limited. So it's important that us as counselors stress the risk one takes when consuming large quantities of alcohol quickly. So education on this is imperative. Um, you know, uh, being a teenager, it's kind of an experimental phase. A lot of teens want to try new things and it's around, it's available to them, but they're not thinking about the risks. And if they're not educated on it, then they might not, you know, set a limit for themselves. So respiratory arrest or aspiration of vomit, which means um, like kind of breathing in their vomit, have been the leading fatal factors in recent high profile deaths of inexperienced young college drinkers after uh, consuming large qualities of alcohol in a short period of time. That's why when you someone's passed out and they're laying on their backs, it's really dangerous in case they do throw up. You don't want them to choke on their throw up. So that's why you hear people say, okay, turn them on their side. So, um, you know, going kind of piggyback, piggybacking, 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 piggybacking off of the conversation that's important, the education that's important to provide teenagers who do have access to alcohol. Um, Not only is it important to educate them, but it's important to educate their parents. Of course, many parents do know the risks and um, aren't going to allow drinking, but they only have so much control. So it's important to educate any type of work that you do with a minor parents is a big part of the work. Working with the parents is a big part, Uh, but it's important to stress to them why they need to also have that conversation with their their children. And blood alcohol concentration, also known as BAC, um, this is just how much alcohol is in the blood. So this can be measured by a breathalyzer or blood sample. Moving on to the other depressant, sedative and hypnotic drugs. So benzodiazepines, uh, also known as bennies, benzos. Um, These are, so, uh, you know, going back to sedatives and hypnotic drugs as a whole, uh, these are another classification of drugs that depress the central nervous system. And Um, The most common are the three listed here, which are benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and non-barbiturates. Benzodiazepines, not only known as benzos or bennies, um, known as tranquilizers, and they're frequently prescribed for a wide range of symptoms from sleeplessness, anxiety, muscular strain, to seizures, so they are actually prescribed by doctors sometimes. Some examples are Valium and Xanax, um, it's very, you know, doctors are, should be very, I hope they're very um, careful with prescribing these types of drugs. So just kind of to um, stress how addicting these are. When I worked at the crisis, the mental health crisis stabilization unit, we wouldn't even prescribe any ben- benzodiazepines because of their highly addictive nature. Oftentimes it was not uncommon for people to come in requesting benzodiazepines, um, whether it was just because that's really what they needed or because they were addicted, we were not allowed to prescribe them. Um, These are highly addictive with long-term use and have serious withdrawal complications requiring medical detoxification as well. So there is a physical component here. Researchers also note that benzodiazepines, even taken as a prescribed a prescription by a legitimate doctor, are toxic to the brain. Um, and this is evidenced by brain scanning techniques showing an overall diminished or dehydrated pattern of activity, just as with drug or abuse. That's also what we'd see there. So, you know, you'll hear that sometimes people are prescribed Xanax for only a short period of time, and it's only to be taken 
It's called a PRN. A PRN is, um, and you'll, you should learn more about this in your pharmacology class, but a PRN is like as needed. So not every day, not every morning, but only as needed. Benzodiazepines are often prescribed as the initial drug for treating anxiety despite research showing limited effectiveness with long-term use, in part due to tolerance issues. So women actually are more at risk for developing a troublesome pattern. Um, and this is interesting because men lead women in numbers of addicts for every substance except prescription medications. So at the crisis unit, um, I would say probably nine times out of 10, it was females uh, seeking the prescription drugs, the benzos. Men tend to um, gravitate towards synthetic drugs, you know, things like that. Benzos can also be referred to as the date rape drug. Um, and that is because, so like roofies, um, a benzodiazepine um, with, you know, they have properties that are, you know, they put someone in, like sedate people. So, you know, they're in a, a phase and they have little control over their bodies. And these, this leads to uh, sexual assault crimes. Barbiturates are fast acting. Um, and something, something to highlight here is their lethal potential. So these are very dangerous and um, can lead to potential lethal overdose, especially if combined, combined with other central nervous system depression. So if someone's drinking alcohol and also taking barbiturates, they are at a huge risk of a fatal overdose because, you know, your heart rate slows down, your blood pressure gets dangerously low because it's like a double depressant. And um, non-barbiturates have the same physical I'm sorry, same psychological and physiological profile as barbiturates do. So they're very similar. So we are going to move on to opioids, but I want to pause here. I want to take a break. I want you guys to stand up, stretch, um, do some deep breathing, think of questions that you might have. Maybe some of you are feeling triggered. I want you to notice that. Maybe some of you are feeling or having some type of reaction that you didn't expect. Maybe some of this hits home to you, to some of you. Maybe you're not having any reaction. All of it is okay. I encourage you to write um, in the forum about personal experiences if you are someone who is having kind of a non-expected reaction. And I will see you in part two of this lecture. Uh, part two is a lot shorter and we will just go over the remaining slides. Okay, I will see you soon.